if you want to then go ahead and jump us off. Um, just to let everybody know, I'm Caitlin. I'm a postdoc at VCBH, um, and I'll be kind of moderating this a little bit with um, with with all of you. So um, I'll have yeah, Diane, go ahead. There we go. All right. Do I look and sound okay? Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead and start the session off. You're gonna be hearing a lot about cardiac patients and smoking, so uh, it'll be a nice cohesive topic. So I'm gonna give the quick overview of the poster that this is work that I did with my prior project manager, Kate Mahoney, and we were looking at the effect of smoking status on changes in cardiorespiratory fitness in cardiac rehabilitation. So brief background, um, continued smoking is the number one predictor of subsequent cardiac events. And those who smoke are also less likely to attend and complete cardiac rehabilitation, which is the gold standard secondary prevention following major cardiac events. So one of the reasons that we think about possibly that our current smokers drop out of cardiac rehab is that current smoking can interfere with fitness gains. And so this poster was to look at the relationship between smoking status and improvements in fitness during cardiac rehab in patients of lower SES status. And one of the reasons why we focus on lower SES patients is because one, they have higher rates of smoking and potentially also by looking at just lower SES patients, we can reduce some of the heterogeneity that you usually see between smoking and non-smoking populations. So methods, this was a secondary analysis of data from two randomized clinical trials testing interventions to increase CR attendance among these lower SES patients. The main outcome was looking at MET-PEAK or peak metabolic equivalence, which was measured using symptom-limited exercise tolerant tests at entry and exit to exit from cardiac rehab. And we were looking at our participants based on whether they were current smokers at their time of hospitalization for their qualifying event versus those who were either non, never smokers or former smokers. And we looked at their baseline demographics, the number of sessions they completed, and then used regression to estimate the impact of smoking status on their improvement in fitness. So here's the baseline characteristics between these. And I just want you to note that there's not a whole lot of difference between our smokers and non-smokers in this low SES sample, which is what I was saying about that reduction in heterogeneity. Usually our smokers or our lower SES patients tend to come in younger and have um, lower educational attainment. So it was nice to remove some of that difference. So looking at the fitness outcomes, both in those who were current smokers at hospitalization and those who were not, we see improvements in peak met from entry to exit. But if you note the magnitude of those changes, the those that were smokers were only improving by you know, 0.9, whereas those who were not smokers were improving by 1.8. So almost a twofold difference. And if you look at this in a regression and see what the variables are that are affecting that change in fitness and improvement in fitness, you can see that even when controlling for other variables that affect improvement in fitness, such as age, gender, and number, most importantly, number of cardiac rehab sessions that the person actually completed, that smoking status is still an independent predictor of improvement in fitness. We also did a little post hoc sensitivity analysis to see uh, which of our groups of those who spoke were really improving versus not. And we see that the real difference between those who were non-smokers versus those who were continued smokers during cardiac rehab um, we had some who quit during cardiac rehab and some who continued. So we're looking a little bit at piecing that out. We didn't have enough numbers to piece out the, the quitters versus the non-smokers. Um, but you can see that the real difference here is between those who were not smokers and those who continued smoking during CR. That is where we see the biggest differences in fitness improvement. So to conclude, those who are smoking at the time of their hospital event are less likely to improve fitness during cardiac rehab even when they control for the number of sessions they've attended. And likely it's those who are continuing to smoke that have the worst outcomes that are really impaired in their fitness improvements. And there is my, my spiel. Great, right, awesome, thank you. Um, we can go ahead and do a, a couple of questions now, um, if anyone has any uh, questions for Diane. Yep, Will. You know, you know how much I love 
fitness improvement and cardiac rehabilitation as a construct, right? So, no, 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 I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Um, so my, my kind of question is, uh, you know, we, I, uh, the idea is that smoking interferes with, you know, fitness improvements and that this predicts dropout. And there's like a few different mechanisms that like you could think of, but like, what, what are your kind of hypotheses, right? For why is it just difficulty or is there something related to like, they see no gains or. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that we really need to piece out. Cause we know from that trial looking at smoking cessation during uh, fitness improvement, those trials to improve fitness, that it was only the people that successfully quit smoking that improved their fitness. So obviously it was something about the smoking itself that was causing an impairment in fitness. And so really I can only kind of hypothesize about what the relationship is within this particular population. But I mean, cause there, there's several reasons that those who smoke are also more likely to drop out. And some of that has to do with just other characteristics such as this is our lower SES patients and their you know, relationship between other health related behaviors. But I have to assume that also getting on a treadmill and trying to improve your aerobic capacity while being a current smoker is an unpleasant experience. Exercising while being a current smoker is an unpleasant experience. And so uh, I assume that, you know, if, if they're not quitting, that, that it's just a hard hurdle to get over, that you are, you know, doing something that's unpleasant and the benefits you're getting from it are probably less. This is maybe not in, well, it's not tangential, but this may be beyond the scope of what you were looking at. Has anyone looked at something with like, or when people come in for cardiac rehab who are still smoking, has anyone ever like tried asking like, when was your last cigarette? Like before this current session and looking at like some relation between like, I don't know, hours before or between having their last cigarette and the current session of cardiac rehab and if that's related to performance or if like people who are chronically smoking just before coming in that are like likely to drop out sooner because it's harder than people who have seen for a little longer or anything along those lines like trying to get into a little more of the difference between the smokers and non-smokers and nutrition yeah uh not not that i know of that i've never seen that kind of level of detail in the cardiac rehab field i mean it's as you know it's not their primary um area of interest or their strongest thing that they work on in cardiac rehab. It's, it's much more about fitness improvement than smoking cessation. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting thing. I, there's also more people um, that we're trying to improve the, the measures that are done in cardiac rehab. And I think with uh, the carbon monoxide measurements that we got in the clinic that maybe we'll be able to start seeing something like that. Um, and I know that clinically, you know, the most that we expect the physicians to do right now is to ask whether people actually are smoking. And um, I know that Sherry, for example, as part of her intake, asks, when was the last, when was the last time you had a cigarette or your last puff of a cigarette? So they do ask around that, but I don't know of anyone actually going into the detail of looking at uh, time to last cigarette and fitness. I have a little bit on, on that if you don't, if it's okay. I think we uh, should I'm gonna jump ahead. over and answer Anne's question really quick and then we should move on. Yeah. Um, so Anne was asking what was the other factors that have strong relationship to fitness. So the ones that we tend to control for because they really um, affect improvements in fitness are sex, women tend to improve less than men, age, those are older, tend to improve less than those are younger. Um, and then we look at other things like diagnoses because you see difference in fitness improvement between those who have a surgical uh, diagnosis, for example, like they underwent cabbage versus the one that had a myocardial infarction. So some of the, those are some of the big ones. Then of course, just the number of sessions that were attended. The more CR sessions you attend, the more your fitness should improve. And with that I should probably hand it off to the next person. Yeah, Brian, if you wanna go ahead and jump in. Right, people can see this, right? Yep. Cool. Perfect. All right. So what I'll be talking about is uh, my project on looking at the differences and the relation between smoking status and then either education or executive function. So that's the wrong one. Okay. So for a little bit of background, um, <clears throat> one second. Okay. Now I have presenter view here. So there's a couple different ways that 
we can look at and evaluate cognitive performance in participant populations um, too that can be used are looking at level of education so just what's the highest amount of schooling that a participant has gotten through and then another is executive function which is this measure of um, a variety of different cognitive processes like ability to plan or organize attend to different tasks shift from one task to another and a couple of other things that i'll be showing on another slide over the years, um, there's been a pretty strong correlation established between education and smoking status, and that generally people who achieve higher and higher levels of education are less likely to smoke. But there's been less looked at when it comes to the relation between executive function and smoking status. So the purpose of this uh, set of data analyses here was to one, look at the relation between smoking status and executive function and see if there's anything there. And then two, compare that to the uh, relation between smoking status and education. So what we did was we took a data set that had already been collected looking at predictors of cardiac rehab participation and we combed through it looking for three different uh, measures. First we looked at smoking status, um, whether participants self-reported themselves as either someone who is currently smoking, someone who used to smoke but no longer does they've quit, or someone who never smoked at all. So three different levels there. We also looked at highest level of education they've achieved, either uh, less than high school, high school degree, some college, full college diploma, or some advanced degree. And then finally, we looked at measures of executive function by administering the uh, behavior rating inventory of executive function in the brief. It's uh, a test that basically asks individuals to self-report on um, impairments in executive function. The overall way the test is broken down is shown here in that there are these, uh, there's. 80 some odd questions that can be factored into nine different categories shown here, ranging from inhibit, ability to inhibit uh, behavior down to whether you can keep things organized. And all nine of those can be factored into these two main subscales of whether you can regulate uh, your behavior and then metacognition. And then those are combined to this overall or, uh, global executive composite. And so once we uh, collected all of these data, we ran a series of ANOVAs looking at how they were correlated with uh, smoking status and education. The results are shown here. Um, generally, what we found is that there wasn't a significant relation between smoking status and executive function. And importantly, this is at several different levels of analysis. So um, there wasn't any significant relation when we looked at the correlation between executive function at like that whole global executive level, like that one big master score and smoking. And then furthermore, we didn't see anything for those two uh, sub-indices of behavioral regulation and metacognition or any of those nine individual scales. So we didn't have any luck there. We then went and did this analysis again, but instead of separating smoking into that those three levels I described previously of a current, former, or never, we just did it as a binary sort of thing where if you have ever smoked at any point, current or former, contrasted with people who have never smoked and trying to see if that influenced our results. However, again, we didn't see any significant relation between executive function and smoking at um, any of those 12 levels of analyses. So the global executive, those two indices, and then the nine basic scales. Despite that, we were able to see a relation between smoking status and education, a significant one regardless of how smoking status was uh, conceptualized. And although it's not shown here, we then looked to see if there was a correlation between executive function and uh, education and didn't see anything, once again, at any of those levels. So on the whole, um, what we were able to conclude from this is we were able to reaffirm the uh, relation between education and smoking, which is great, but we didn't see any significant relation between executive function and smoking, which suggests that well, they probably aren't as equivalent as maybe I had initially thought, and they probably look at two different aspects of cognitive performance that can't really be equated. So I'm happy to take questions. We can do a couple questions for Brian. I got to say, I'm surprised about the lack of smoking status and executive function. My, my one thought is that maybe um, we're seeing the differences that are driven by age of onset or comorbidity or something that those, that this is just a younger, 
younger group in general and some of those executive function issues were were lower for that reason because yeah I'm, I am surprised I am glad that you know the the educational effect was still there because I really would have been worried about our data set um, but have you do you have thoughts about other other impacts on executive function in this group yeah so I kind of breezed through it um but to I wanted to note one thing um so I'll bring this up quickly um there was oh it's kind of a mess but emotional control um so I mentioned how like we broke it down into these individual levels emotional control was close I mean it's not significant but it was pretty close compared to some of the other measures um so we tried to be a little more specific by actually looking at all the individual scales and seeing if like maybe some of them were washing and others out or blocking things and that's why we didn't see anything in that global level but still no cigar um it's possible age played a role um i don't remember what the overall age of this population was I'm trying to find it now and how that breaks down between the smokers and non-smokers but that's something to look at in the future yeah and that it was what what about 10 percent current smokers or was it higher it was it was uh pretty low the vast majority of people were um either had never smoked or were i think that the majority was never had smoked and i think it was like maybe 30 or so people had smoked or not had smoked were currently smoking out of yeah so i guess we should also remember that this is a group that uh agreed to be part of uh research at the hospital <laughs> so they're a little they're a little selected also yeah. it was 10 percent were current smokers you're correct i see ann has a comment here too she's skeptical of executive function by self-report need to measure it that's fair i'm not overly familiar with the brief um i've known about it for i don't know two, three months now. Yeah. So um, I'm pretty green when it comes to measuring executive function. Um, what I'm unclear about what other ways there are. I'd love to look at that. There, there are objective tasks for measuring executive function. Some of the ones which we do um, in, in clinic, right? Those are some of the objective oh, yeah. measures. So um, two of the things I will say for Anne, one, um, those objective measures are often very normed and they don't move around a lot. So they can be a little hard to look at changes in things. And two, um, I believe the brief was done in hospital because this was done in hospital. And so it was something that could actually be administered in a hospital setting without too much issue. The parent study was the um, participants were met in the hospital and that was pretty much it for contact with them, at least from the study side of things. All right, great. Um, we can move on to our next presenter. Will, I think. Yep. Cool. Let me get my screen shared. All right, can you see my screen but not my notes? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so this is the quality of life in lower socioeconomic status smokers attending cardiac rehabilitation. So at current, one quarter of all deaths in the United States can be attributed to cardiovascular disease, and a subcategory of CVD, coronary artery disease, accounts for one out of every five deaths in those younger than 65. Besides the medical consequences of CAD, one of the unspoken casualties from heart disease is patient's quality of life. Following an adverse cardiac event, it is really common for a patient's quality of life to decrease. These events are really traumatic and they result in patients having like low energy. They experience physical pain, like especially after like a surgical intervention um, and it increases rates of depression and anxiety and of course, having a heart attack or some other similar event results in increased death-related thoughts. So holistic patient treatment uh, involves addressing patient's psychological and quality of life needs alongside improving their physical health. 
Secondary prevention measures like cardiac rehabilitation are an integral facet in controlling cardiac symptoms and death rates in patients who have already suffered from an adverse cardiac event. Cardiac rehabilitation, or CR, is an evidence-based, outpatient, clinic-centered intervention that has been shown to reduce future CAD-related morbidity and mortality by up to 26% at one year post-intervention. Uh, CR reduces these rates by increasing patients' cardiovascular health through structured exercise prescriptions, dietary and health education, and promoting smoking cessation or abstinence, and improving adherence to medications. One of the biggest challenges CR programs face is engendering smoking cessation. Smoking is one of the strongest predictors of mortality and morbid morbidity after those cardiac events. And unfortunately, rates of smoking are considerably higher in vulnerable populations, such as those with affective disorders or dis uh, deficits in executive functioning, and especially patients of like lower SES. And smoking is also associated with lower quality of life in the population at large. In 2014, a, syst a systematic review of 54 studies identified a really strong negative association between smoking and quality of life. And further, smoking cessation itself uh, with, uh, is associated with improvements in health-related quality of life. So it's important for CR programs to understand this relationship within their own patients, and especially patients of lower SCS that have high vulnerability. At current, however, no study has surveyed the quality of life in smoking patients of lower SES. Uh, so this study was an exploratory secondary data analysis of 130 low SES patients, and they were defined by having Medicaid insurance. These patients were part of a randomized control trial of financial incentives to improve their attendance. Uh, smoking and non-smoking patients were compared by baseline demographics uh, in hospital and across three factors of quality of life from the MAC new uh, you know, quality of life scale. Their emotional, uh, physical, and social quality of life were taken at baseline along with like the composite global MAC new scores. So first we noticed an incredibly high percentage of smokers in our lower SES samples, 42% compared to the 20 to 36% you'd expect in uh, the general population. of so two striking differences appeared between smoking and non-smoking patients. So first, smokers were quite a bit younger than non-smokers, the seven years, like on average. Uh, smokers would also go on to complete 11 fewer cardiac rehab sessions than uh, non-smokers, which is a really powerful predictor of their, their future health status in CR. Um, other than that, no, though, no other demographic factors were significantly different. So as for quality of life, there were no real substantive differences between these patients. Uh, if you look at the bar graph, uh, you can see that the mean scores for smoking patients were lower across these categories, but this difference is really marginal. Um, and, but this, this trend did make me look at whether there's some sort of like, uh, um, like suppression effect uh, potentially by non-smokers like advanced age, right? Lowering their scores. Um, so lack of findings on quality of life may be due to several factors, including just this really uh, real lack of an effect. Um, it may be possible that smokers younger age, right, like we were talking about, may have ameliorated differences in their quality of life, or that cardiac, di uh, cardiac diagnoses just simply overwhelm all patients. Our findings on the number of sessions patients attended matched with prior literature, um, and there are a trifecta of relationships here where smokers are in the greatest need of cardiac rehabilitation, are more likely to have low SES and have considerably lower rates of attendance and judging by this adherence. CR programs really need to consider these patients not only for recruitment and referral to increase attendance, but also for interventions designed to improve their adherence to sessions like contingency management. The age effects we found were also expected. Smokers tend to have cardiac events earlier due to poor health relative to their age bracket. Uh, in fact, I was digging around and in our sample, cardiorespiratory fitness uh, really didn't differ between uh, patients younger than 60 and those older than 60. Um, so future research should uh, control for age effects, which I've done, which I'm fully willing to talk about in the chat. 
Um, you should also look at whether improvements in quality of life differ from baseline to completion of CR between smokers and non-smokers, and if that differs for people who quit. Um, and if these effects exist in a normative SES sample. Okay, that is my presentation. So I will... Can you take a couple questions for Will? Uh, Wait, no, Don, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I wondered whether the quality of life, did it, one would think it would improve with cardiac rehab uh, due to physical activity. I wondered whether it did uh, in your study. I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. I'm sorry, I'll repeat. Did quality of life improve uh, in patients over the course of cardiac rehab? I have not looked at that okay. yet. I'm, act I'm actually still uh, calculating the scores for uh, at exit, right? Um, so I would suspect that they do, but I didn't have time before this presentation to, uh, because the Mac new has a lot of different quality qual or, uh, answers and it takes me a long time to like get the entire database score. <laughs> um, you know, I've, of course, as some, someone who likes cardiac rehab, I believe they do. Right. And I'm sure there's literature out there, <laughs> but I haven't personally looked at the, the end scores yet. Yeah, and we should, we have MACNU and we have Uracol as well, right? So we should have cardiac specific as well as the global. Yeah. Um, so I'll be also looking at the Uracol would be something that would be interesting. Right. Yeah, it was, that was going to be my question is, um, so the MACNU, it is cardiac specific, right? So is there, is there a symptom or on there that you would expect to specifically differentiate between the smokers and the non-smokers? Well, in the, the physical uh, uh, quality of health area, um, I would expect that, I don't remember the exact questions uh, off the top of my head, but I would expect that they would have worse scores on that, right? Because they have the decrease, that you have decreased cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, so uh, I, I would, would expect that their activity levels, what they feel impaired by, right, would be higher. We know that smokers, um, you know, like if you smoke a cigarette, like acutely before about of exercise, you experience pain sooner in cardiorespiratory or in cardiovascular exercise, right? Uh, but that didn't appear. <laughs> so I can I, I did control for age thinking that that would do it. I actually reversed the, uh, the direction and made it so that smokers had better quality of life. <laughs> Not significantly, but. I had a question, Will. When yeah. you're looking at the number of sessions that individual attendants saw the difference between the groups at that main level, were there any sorts of, like when you're looking through the data to see um, any differences or any sort of characteristics you could pull out for those individuals that, so at the main level, they were different, but were there individuals that if they had a certain threshold, like if they made it to like session number 12, they were more likely to finish from there on out. Um, yeah, um, so I think that Diane actually did a, a, a CART analysis on this and found that nine sessions was the most, the highest risk group, if I remember correctly. Um, what, I, what you tend to see in the data, just looking at the distribution for the patients that we normally have, is that there are a ton of people that have zero sessions. Obviously, we just collect baseline data on them. A bunch of people that have one session, right? And then once you make it to around uh, to a higher number number of sessions, I don't know, like around like twenty, then you're much more likely to 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 make it on through. I'm not sure the exact number that that uh, where the the curve like stable uh, becomes stable, but I would just remembering the distributions. It looks like twenty is about that point, and nine is the, the point. Like uh, um, we'd expect people with really uh, high risk profiles to or really high risk profiles for non-completion to not get more than nine sessions. It would be interesting then if you could kind of figure out a way to further, I mean, potentially further incentivize getting past that sort of benchmark and to see if that could be a way. Yeah, to... that, that would be really interesting. Just like, you know, because nine sessions, uh, two or three sessions a week, uh, that gets you to, uh, you know, uh, quite a while of, uh, of CR, about almost a month of cardiac rehab, 
Um, and I don't know. I don't know if that's enough to establish a habit. But that'd be really interesting to see if um, the if if people aren't attending uh, past those amount of sessions because there's something about it that disagrees with them, or if it's just because it, the initiation is hard to go to each session. Um, so that would be really interesting. All right, we're going to move to our last presenter and then um, allow a few questions for Blair and then we can circle back to anything else that people might um, want to comment on. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Blair. Thank you. All right, thinking. Talk a little bit faster than most computers like to move. So I apologize for that in advance as well. All right, so um, we were looking at the characteristics of hospitalized cardiac patients that smoke. So patients who continue smoking following cardiac events or surgeries do have an increased uh, risk of morbidity and mortality. And while most patients do abstain from smoking while they are hospitalized, the relapse rate post-hospitalization is high due to the gap that patients face um, after they exit the hospital where they're getting you know, smoking cessation um, assistance and advice from the staff that they have in the hospital um, unless they you know, really reach out for it in the community themselves. Once they've left the hospital, it is um, pretty difficult to find versus that everyday um, care that they're getting in hospital. So the aim of this study was to collect demographic information and smoking status of the hospitalized cardiovascular patients that had a cardiac rehab qualifying diagnosis for the purposes of designing a post-hospitalization tobacco cessation intervention. So we did use a quality improvement study design for this project. So between July 30th and October 1st, patients admitted to the cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery floors here at the University of Vermont Medical Center were screened. Those with eligible cardiac diagnoses for cardiac rehab were um, myocardial infarctions, percutaneous coronary interventions, coronary artery bypass grafts, and then valve repairs and placements. Uh, replacements were considered um, eligible for cardiac rehab. Um, of the identified patients, we collected age, sex, and location, and using the HRSA eligibility lookup tool, patient location that we collected was classified as either rural or non-rural. In addition, we did collect smoking information, including smoking status, type, amount, and then the quit date for our former smokers that we found. We used chi-square tests for the categorical variables and t-tests for continuous variables. So a total of 169 patients were identified as eligible, and of these 169, 23 were listed as current smokers. Uh, the remaining patients that we had were considered non-smokers, and there was 146 of them broken down into 90 former smokers and 56 never smokers. We can see that the current smokers differed most greatly in age from both the total sample average as well as their non-smoking counterparts. On average, the current smokers were a decade younger then the remaining sample with an average age of 59 versus this 69 and 70.5. Um, we also see that three quarters of the current smokers were located in rural areas as defined by that HRSA eligibility earlier. So I was able to pull this map directly from the tool that we were using um, to identify rural status. Uh, this is from the HRSA lookup tool is its official name. Uh, we can see here the counties in New York and Vermont broken up into rural and non-rural with the rural counties being shaded in purple and the non-rural counties being unshaded. And then I did have Chittenden County where we're located here in Vermont um, outlined in blue for reference of location. Here uh, we can see where the 23 current smokers are located by county. As you can see, all but six of the current smokers are located within what we designated as a rural county and the outlying um, current smokers were residing within Chittenden County, which is the only non-rural county in Vermont. So the identification of this rural location status is important because we know that patients located in rural areas not only have higher smoking rates, but they do have lower quit rates on average in comparison to patients located in non-rural or urban areas. 
So of the 90 former smokers, seven had quit within the last three months of their hospitalization date. And these recent quitters are at an elevated risk for relapse versus the remainder of the former smokers, which had an average quit date of 31 years ago versus that three months. Uh, when we compare the demographics of these recently quit smokers to the current smokers as we are here on this slide, uh, we can see that they're much more similar than they are to the um, non-smoking population, which I pulled from the earlier table. Uh, we see at an average age of 63 years old, uh, the recent quitters are much more um, similar in age uh, with being closer to that 59 years of age versus the 70 that we have in the non-smoking status. And we also see that the recently quits, recently quit smokers um, we're smoking about the same amount of cigarettes per day as the current smokers, which is line, in line with the national average, which is being reported as less than a pack a day right now. So based on the findings that I listed and breezed through really quickly, uh, we can see that both current smoking population as well as the recently quit smokers are on average younger and they do live in rural areas. So it's likely that a remote intervention would be optimal in providing um, the post-hospitalization tobacco cessation support so that we can reach as many patients as possible. All right. Question. Thanks, job, Blair. <laughs> Oh, that was excellent. And it's, it's just great because it really does kind of point the direction for, for where to go. So I was thinking about questions around this and my questions are, are more thinking about kind of imp implementation. We just spent, uh, those of us that were in the BCBH conference, uh, looking about the various types of interventions that were, that were being offered. And like, for example, the whole text versus app idea of interventions. And so I was thinking if you had any thoughts about um, an app versus text for, for this particular, particular population? So um, based on my experience with the population that we have here in Vermont, they, with, especially with the more rural concerned patients, uh, we do have, like we saw a much older sample um, than I would think in other, you know, more urban cities that have just more people in general than Vermont and New York do or upstate New York do. So I think, you know, sticking with text messages would possibly be easier and just more accessible for patients that, you know, don't necessarily have access to things like smartphones because they are located in more rural areas. Any other questions for Blair? It looks like Don's coming back in too. Um, I can also say we can also answer questions from any of the speakers at this point if someone had a question for any of the four of us. We've got about four minutes left. No burning questions. All right. Well, I'm not going to keep people on here if we're if we're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about the poster session. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we can go ahead and adjourn this um, this poster session. The next one, again, I think three groups. Next one is at five fifteen. Um, so be sure to come back and see our last um, few groups of uh, poster presenters. Yeah, I guess we can share what those are. So yeah, next group is at 515. We have one that's focused on ends, another one that's focused on incentives and um, those who are using opioids, and then a third group on behavioral economics. So a little bit of something for everybody in the second set. And uh, Sherry excellently chatted just to me, but said excellent job all. So, uh, which I have to, I have to echo. That was a great set of uh, presentations. Thank you all for uh, 
your good work. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you in the next in the next session. <laughs> Thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.